you know, often, often there's many different narratives you can use to tell a story. So I had to kind of settle on, on one particular story. Uh, there are others I could give. But anyways, I went, I went with this one. So hopefully uh, it'll work. So, you know, the, the, the field of foundations is, is about uh, trying to understand quantum theory. So we have this theory. It, it works really well. Um, you know, we can use it in applications, but we don't really understand it. And, and evidence for that is uh, there's no agreement about how to interpret it, for example. Uh, so I, I find this is always a bit hard to explain. How can it be that, you know, we know how to use this theory and yet we don't really understand it? So the analogy that I like, which I find is useful, is it's like knowing how to drive a car. You know, if, if, you've, if you've got a car and you know how to drive it, you can get from A to B. It's useful. It's a tool. Uh, and maybe, you know, that's all you want. You want to get from A to B, and you're done. But if your car breaks down one day and you're not a mechanic, uh, knowing how to drive it doesn't help you. It doesn't help you figure out how to fix it. So I think quantum mechanics is a bit like that. Uh, we know how to drive it. You know, it gets us from A to B. Uh, but if we found someday that it fails, uh, an experiment, for instance, or maybe it's inconsistent in its conceptual scheme with some other theory, um, then we don't really know, you know what to do. We, we don't really see under the hood of quantum mechanics. We, we don't really understand what's going on in this theory. Um, good. So, so there's a bunch of different activities that happen in the field. People look at trying to interpret the formalism. Uh, but another activity which people have done more in recent years is trying to reformulate quantum mechanics. So we already have many formulations. There's like the path integral formulation. There's a Hamiltonian formulation. Uh, but we have new formulations now, which emphasize various different features. And, and then more importantly, people try to re reconstruct it. So the, the idea here is to replace the textbook axioms. Uh, so the textbook axioms say things like, um, you know, the state space is a Hilbert space over the complex field. And systems combined by tensor product. And, and so there's a lot of mathematical notions that just show up there right in, in the postulates of the theory. And what we'd prefer to have is a set of physical principles uh, from which the mathematical axioms would follow, or from which the, the mathematical formalism would follow. So it's a bit like uh, when in 1905, uh, Einstein reformulated uh, well, he, he set down a set of axioms from which you could derive the Lorentz transformations. The Lorentz transformations were known. Uh, but he showed that if the physics, physics is the same in all reference frame and the speed of light is independent of the speed of the source, then it would have to be the Lorentz transformations that relate different reference frames. So there's sort of a similar project in quantum theory, trying to get underneath these mathematically phrased postulates to something uh, more physical. And so... So, so, you know, one question is, you know, what will be the nature of those, those axioms? Um, and, and the kind of research that I do explores the information theoretic approach to that idea. So that's what's actually been happening a lot in the last 10 years, partly because of the influence of quantum information theory. So the foundations of quantum mechanics has been strongly influenced by all these ideas coming out of information theory. So let me say, I'm going to say a bit more about the, the role of information theory. Um, <clears throat> so... If you think about revolutions in physics, usually what comes to mind is uh, you know, a point where somebody proposed a theory uh, that made different predictions from the one that came before it. So you know, we hear about uh, you know, the Copernican revolution or, or uh, you know, Newtonian mechanics, general relativity, quantum mechanics. And in all those cases, you could say, right, there's some novel predictions there uh, that actually disagree with the theory that came before. The theory that came before is shown to be wrong. Uh, and so if, if that's, you know, your lens on history, then you have a particular notion of, you know, what, what do you have to do to bring about a revolution in physics? Oh, you know, maybe you have to find the right equation. And that equation somehow captures to good approximation all the stuff that came before, but in some new realms goes slightly beyond it. Um, but there's, there's a different uh, view you can take on that. There's, there are other kinds of revolutions, I think, that happen in physics. And, and they're slower and they're more conceptual. So these, these are revolutions where people take a new perspective on an old theory, and, and the new perspective doesn't necessarily overthrow that, that theory. So I think a good example is the use of action principles. So in the uh, 17th and, and 18th centuries, people like Lagrange and Hamilton reformulated Newtonian mechanics 
using action principles. So they were building on work by you know Firma, who had this uh, principle that you know light will uh, follow the path of least time, or Maupertuis, who had this way of formulating mechanics as a principle of least action, and Lagrange and Hamilton and others uh, systematized that and basically understood how you could formulate. Newtonian mechanics in this action principle sort of way, which is a very different sort of notion. So rather than the Newtonian picture of things receiving impulses and, and undergoing their dynamics, this idea said, okay, let's take the whole trajectory and ask, you know, what properties does the whole trajectory have? And it turns out that it optimizes certain, uh, certain quantities, such as the action. And it's, it didn't overthrow Newtonian mechanics, uh, but it offered a completely new perspective on how to think about Newtonian mechanics. And uh, it completely transformed uh, the way people did physics. Uh, and so, you know, now today, of course, you know, we're all about writing down Lagrangians to express, you know, what's going on with a particular physical system. Um, so I think, I think um, if, if you look, for example, at the birth of quantum theory, and you say, well, you know, what, what explains that revolution? Well, part of the story is that de Broglie was thinking about uh, action principles. He was, in fact, thinking about the analogy between Fermat's principle. Uh, so, so there's there's an analogy between Fermat's principle and Maupertuis's principle. One is for light, the other is for mechanics. But he knew that uh, in the case of light, there's a wave theory of light, and the ray theory of light is just an approximation to that. So he said, well, if I look at this analogy, then you know maybe uh, when we look at mechanics, it also should be thought of as sort of the the ray theory for some deeper wave theory of mechanics. Uh, and so, so the, the whole perspective that was brought, brought about by action principles uh, influenced the, the birth of quantum mechanics. Second example would be the use of symmetries. Uh, so, so that also has a long history. Um, uh, people like you know Lagrange uh, was interested in symmetries. Um, you know, uh, Galilean relativity is about symmetry. It, the birth of special relativity. Is Einstein making use of symmetries in a constructive way? And then in more modern times, you have people like Curie and Wigner, who basically, you know, really use the tools of mathematical the mathematical representation of groups to understand atomic physics and nuclear physics. And again, the use of symmetry is not overthrowing some theory. It's not as if quantum mechanics was shown to be wrong. It was just sort of a new lens by which to look at everything. And again, if you look at you know modern day physics. Uh, you know, we, we, we write down Lagrangians and we demand that they have certain kinds of symmetries. So, you know, the, the birth of QED and QCD has a lot to do with this revolution involving both action principles and the use of symmetries in physics. Um, so these, these kinds of revolutions are more about, you know, how you should think about things. They don't necessarily overthrow what came before. And I think there's another revolution like that happening today, and it's the use of information theory. So... Um, so we want to take a perspective on the physics that we have, which is information theoretic, essentially. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, the, if, if, you, if you talk to the quantum information theorists, so I used to do some quantum information theory. I still do a bit of quantum information theory. And uh, most of what happens there is trying to solve problems that are of interest to computer scientists using quantum physics. Uh, so the slogan that Landauer introduced was that information is physical. And the idea was that for a long time, people in computer science departments thought that you know, figuring out what a computer could do is, is an exercise in logic, and it has nothing to do with physics at all. Uh, and then slowly people realized, well, computers are, are built out of stuff, and that stuff obeys the laws of physics. And so the laws of physics may well be relevant to what you can compute in the world. Uh, and so this slogan that information is physical is, is meant to remind you that uh, any information processing task you want to do relies on the physics of the world that you're living in. And so, so in the last you know, 10, 15 years, people have made a lot of headway in trying to figure out you know, what, what kinds of algorithms can you solve perhaps more quickly using a quantum computer, a computer that obeys the laws of quantum physics. Uh, you know, what can you do in, in the realm of cryptography? So we have these uh, secure key distribution protocols using quantum mechanics. Uh, you know, what can you do in terms of communication over channel? All those sorts of questions have now been, people have started addressing them uh, using quantum physics. And, and that's still going, and it's interesting. But the flip side of that is, is that 
uh, physics is informational. So not information is physical. Physics is informational, uh, by which I mean it's useful to change your perspective on physics and, and say, what can an information theoretic perspective teach me about any given problem in physics? Um, so here the idea is take problems that are not of interest to computer scientists, but problems that are of interest to physicists, and, and take an information theoretic approach to them and see if you can make progress. Uh, and so uh, roughly speaking, uh, you could say that most of my research is, is about that, taking this information theoretic approach to problems in physics. And most of my research is about trying to understand quantum theory, so taking an informational, information theoretical approach to understanding quantum mechanics. Uh, and so that means, you know, what, what is an information theoretic approach? Well, uh, you know, it involves logic, um, the theory of probability, or you know, more specifically, the theory of inference. You know, what should I infer about one thing given that I have uh, a lack of information? Or, um, you know, Shannon's theory of communication, the theory of computation, uh, the theory of algorithmic information. So what's common to all these things is they're sort of agent-based. There's always sort of an agent in the background who has some knowledge or is trying to infer one thing from another. And uh, uncertainty is, is a key concept. And you know, even prior to quantum information theory, people were using these concepts. So uh, if you go back all the way to the beginning of the 20th century, uh, people like Sillard were, were talking about, or Maxwell's demon even is a good example of the relevance of information theory to thermodynamics. And when Born introduced the statistical interpretation of quantum states, that was also an example of information theory showing up. Uh, so anyways, broadly speaking, that's, that's you know, the, the story. So that's how I see uh, a potential revolution in physics happening sometime soon. It may well be that by taking this information theoretic perspective, we won't change the theory that came before, but we'll have a totally new perspective on it. And that will prepare us for the next revolution in much the same way that action principles and symmetry principles um, prepared the ground for other revolutions in physics. Okay, that's my intro. Let me just pause there for questions. Yes. So, um, can you just give us like a more of a concrete example, or like a, maybe maybe a small example that you know, is some Sure. Okay, yeah. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll be doing that in, in the next thing I say. Okay. So. <laughs> so you'll see an example. Uh, other questions about the big picture? All right. Um, in that case, let me just launch into a few more specific topics. So, so the first topic... I'm going to talk about is resource theories. Uh, so I spend maybe a third of my time thinking about these things. Uh, maybe I could say quantum resource theories more specifically. And uh, the idea here is, I mean, maybe the, the first great example of a resource theory was entanglement theory. So the story is that uh, in, in the early 90s, people were just starting to think about quantum information theory. Uh, people knew about Bell's theorem. I won't tell you all about Bell's theorem today, but if you take my course, you'll, you'll actually, you've probably heard it in Adrian's course, yeah. So, uh, so people were, you know, were thinking about Bell's theorem, um, and they were thinking about foundational problems, and entanglement kept cropping up as an important concept. So the, the states that Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen use in their famous paper, and the states that appear in Bell's paper are entangled states. And uh, what happened is that people started realizing that these things were actually useful for something. So uh, in particular, Arthur Eckert in 91 showed that you could do secure key distribution uh, by violating Bell inequalities. Um, so two parties could be sure that if there was an eavesdropper on their channel, they could detect that eavesdropper. Uh, so that was a sense in which entanglement was suddenly you know, practically useful. And, and then uh, Bill Wooters, uh, another early quantum information theorist, was thinking about uh, doing, figuring out what kind of quantum state you had and whether local measurements, if you have a quantum state over two systems, are local measurements enough to figure out what quantum state you have. And he found strong evidence that actually, no, if, if you know, your two systems are together in the same labs, that you can do measurements, joint measurements on the pair, 
uh, that was, you could do better than if your two systems were far apart and you couldn't do these joint measurements. Um, and then Charlie Bennett uh, said, hey, that, uh, that reminds me of entanglement. Um, you know, could it be that if you had some entanglement, you might be able to do just as well as if you had the two systems together? So two parties are trying to figure out what state they have. Suppose they also share some entanglement. Could they use that? And it turned out uh, the answer was yes. And that was the birth of the quantum teleportation paper, which has about six authors on it. And all of a sudden, so the way that quantum teleportation works is that um, you have a system analysis lab uh, and a system in Bob's lab. They share some entanglement. Uh, what they can do is transport the quantum state of the system analysis lab to a quantum system in Bob's lab using only this entangled resource and a classical channel like a telephone. So they're not going to actually send a quantum system between Alice and Bob. They're just going to you know, talk on the telephone, send classical systems. Uh, but they're going to use this resource of entangled state. And at the end of it, the, the resource is used up. Uh, but they've managed to transfer the quantum information over. So effectively, this entangled state has allowed them to simulate having a quantum channel, even though they didn't have one. So all of us, so I, I think that was sort of a key moment, because people started realizing, oh, we should think about entanglement in the same way we think about any old resource. Um, you know, we should try to quantify it. We should try to figure out exactly what it's useful for. Does it have different kind of forms? Can we transform it from one form to another? If so, how well, and, and so on. Um, and, and that's worked really well. So, so the, uh, I think that model, again, it's, it's a very information theoretic model because it's agent based. It's about you know, what can Alice and Bob do. And entanglement is about correlations between the two systems. So it's about how much information one system has about the other. Uh, that kind of model um, is very useful to apply to other areas of physics. So I'm just going to tell you about a, a few examples of that. So um, the way you can define a resource theory is you start by defining a restricted set of operations. Uh, so in the case of entanglement theory, this is... Uh, theory of entanglement. I'll have a few other examples as well. Uh, in the case of entanglement theory, the restricted set of operations are called uh, local operations and classical communication. And so the idea is that two parties, like Alice and Bob, can do anything they want in their own lab, so any quantum operation at all, so any unitary dynamics, for example, or unitary dynamics that couples the system of interest to some other noisy system in their lab. Uh, and they can communicate by a classical channel. Now, that's restricted because uh, they could have had a quantum channel, in which case they could have sent any old quantum system back and forth between them. Um, and, and then the resource in that case is anything that Alice and Bob, in that scenario, could not prepare themselves. right? Because if, if they've only got the classical channel and these local operations, uh, turns out that they can only generate certain kinds of quantum states. And the ones that they can't generate are called entangled states. And so if Charlie gives them an entangled state, distributes to the two lab, well, um, they better take care because if they destroy it, then they haven't got anything left. And so they sort of want to use it in the most efficient way possible because they can't generate it themselves. And we know because of teleportation that that quantum state can um, simulate having, you know, simulate one use of a quantum channel. So it's a very valuable thing. So the resource here is in entangled states. Um, and so you know, entanglement theory is now uh, you know, maybe 15 years old or something. And uh, it's, it's been worked out in great detail, you know, all sorts of features of this theory. So the kinds of questions that people have answered about entanglement now um, are, are of the following sort. You know, when are two states equivalent under local operations and classical communication? So you might have two states that look different, but it turns out that you can transform one to the other by these operations and back again. So in the, in the resource theory context, those two states are just totally equivalent. So you really want to find the equivalence classes, first of all. Uh, and then once you've got the equivalence classes, you, know, you really need to, then, then you can sort of find a, a standard form in every class. And that's, that will tell you about these different kinds of resources. And then you can ask something like, um, 
if I have a state psi and a state phi, is it possible to do one of these operations, which will deterministically take me from psi to phi? So psi is some bipartite state, so is phi. You want to know? Yes? I Good. Understand. Okay. Um, so, so a classical channel is typically defined as one that um, will effectively make a measurement in some orthogonal basis. So, for example, if I have uh, you know a, a single two-level quantum system, so perhaps Adrian talked a bit about qubits and in, in the So, if I have a single qubit, um, then I can you know prepare it in any state. In, in the block sphere. And did you talk about the block sphere? Yep. Any state in the block sphere. Uh, but if I have to pass it uh, through a measurement that, say, measures uh, you know, along the, the, the z axis, uh, then you know, all, that comes, all that can get through reliably are states that are up or down along the z axis. And so I should prepare states in that basis if I want to communicate through that channel. And any other state will get decohered. So it'll end up being just a probabilistic mixture of up and down if I send it to that channel. So, so if I have such a channel, I can't send you any coherence. Um, I, I can't prepare a coherent superposition of z up and z down. I can only send you uh, effectively a classical bit of information or a mixture of the two possibilities for that bit. Uh, and so, you know, if I have, if I've, somebody's given me a quantum state, uh, I don't know what that quantum state is. And quantum mechanics tells me that there's no measurement I can do that will tell me with certainty what the quantum state was. But if my task is to transfer it to you intact, then I would need a quantum channel to do that. And what teleportation shows is that even if we only have a classical channel, which does this, this measurement on a particular basis, but we share an entangled state, then there's a fancy protocol that allows me to get the quantum state to you intact. Other questions? Um, so, so I was going through a list of the kinds of questions you might ask of entanglement theory. Um, you know, can, can some bipartite state psi be transformed to phi deterministically? That's a good question. Uh, and has a very elegant mathematical solution involving the theory of majorization. Uh, you can also ask, it, can it be done probabilistically? So maybe you can't do it all the time, but some of the time you can get to phi. And if so, what's the largest probability with which you can do that? Uh, and then another question that people really like to ask is if you have n copies of psi, so you've got n systems like this, uh, so these are n copies, and you want to know whether you can go um, approximately to m copies of phi, uh, approximate in the sense that in the limit that n goes to infinity, you know, you're, you're arbitrarily close to your target. So this is like saying I want to um, transform, you know, one kind of resource into another kind of resource. And the question is, what's the rate? You know, what's the largest value of m over n that I can achieve? So if, if this is sort of half as good a resource as that one, then perhaps I can get twice as many of these from, from that. So I can double my number. Uh, so, so the rate at which you convert psi to phi is a kind of measure of entanglement. Tells you how, you know, which is better, psi or phi, and it turns out for that these these bipartite systems, uh, you can interconvert any two states reversibly in this asymptotic sense. That's uh, one of the early results from entanglement theory. What's what's the rate at which you can do this? Uh, and and what people found is is that by asking all these questions and answering them, they suddenly had a much better understanding of how entanglement worked. And the list of applications, you know, the senses in which you should think of entanglement as a resource, got longer and longer. So people now know, OK, you know, not only can you do uh, secure key distribution, uh, there are all sorts of other protocols uh, that use entangled states. Um, so for example, there's, there's uh, something called dense coding, where you sort of get more information through your channel than, than you would otherwise by using entangled states. Uh, or there are two-party computational tasks so, um, so, so Alice and Bob want to, they each have some data, they want to compute some function of their joint data, but they want to minimize the amount of communication they have to do. So, you know, let's say they're trying to agree on a date where they can uh, get together. Well, Alice could send her whole calendar to Bob, but that's a lot of communication. 
So what's sort of the minimum amount of communication they can get back and forth such that they can come up with some day where they're both free? Those sorts of problems also get a benefit by using entangled states. Uh, so I, I'm a big fan of the resource theory approach. It, it's, it's very um, you know, practically minded, uh, but at the end of it, you end up understanding the phenomena much better because you're forced to answer all these very technical questions and get a, an understanding of, of the, uh, the resource in question. So one of the things I've been working on um, is, is the resource theory, I like to call it the resource theory of asymmetry. Uh, so here, the restricted set of operations are operations that have some symmetry. We'll just call them symmetric operations. So what do I mean by that? Um, let's take a particular example. Uh, rotationally symmetric operations. So suppose I have some spins, uh, and they undergo some evolution. And, and for example, they might go through an external magnetic field. Well, that's not a symmetric operation, because that external magnetic field defines an axis in space, uh, and therefore you know, the, the evolution of my spins is in no way rotationally symmetric. But if they undergo interactions with one another, and there's no you know, background field that picks out an axis in space, then that whole uh, interaction is rotationally symmetric. And if you want to be more precise, uh, you could say define an, an evolution as rotationally symmetric if whenever some state psi gets mapped to phi, uh, then were I to you know, rotate the state psi first, then it would get mapped to precisely the rotated, the same rotation of phi for all rotations. So SO2 is the group of rotations. Uh, so this would correspond to a uh, rotationally symmetric unitary. Say there's a unitary B that takes side to phi. If it has this feature, that's rotation symmetric. Um, so it's, it's easy to imagine that that might be, uh, you, you might have some restriction operations that forces you to only do the, the symmetric ones. Um, he, here's a very practical example of it. it. Suppose Alice and Bob are you know, far away in space, let's say they're floating in their spaceships, and and they don't have any common notion of you know, what's up. So uh, you know, if, if we're on Earth, right, then you know, we, we can have a common notion of what's up by the gravitational field. Or maybe we can point to some fixed stars and say, that's what I mean by up. But imagine that Alice and Bob don't have access to the fixed stars. They don't have any common notion of up. Then if Alice sends to Bob a spin and says to Bob, OK, I want you to uh, rotate this around the z-axis by 15 degrees and send it back to me. And she has a notion of what you know, z is. It's you know, maybe some gyroscopes in her spaceship are well aligned and defines up for her. So she sends it off to Bob, and Bob says, well, I, I can't do that because I don't have any sample of uh, your z-axis. So I can't do a rotation by 15 degrees about z. And if she says, oh, can you prepare me a spin that's you know, up along z? He says, no, I can't do that either because I don't have any sample of your z-axis. Um, and if you ask, well, what are, what are the operations that Bob can do, it ends up being just the ones that are symmetric, rotationally invariant operations. So for instance, you know, he could take two spins and interact them together right, by a, by a, a rotation symmetric coupling. So you know, there's certain things he can still do, uh, things that don't require him to have access to Alice's Cartesian frame. So in that scenario, uh, you know, the, this, the resource theory of asymmetry tells you about you know, what Bob can do even though he lacks Alice's reference frame. And, and so the resource here are just asymmetric quantum states. So these, these are quantum states that break rotational symmetry. Uh, these are the things that Bob can't prepare. You know, Alice says, prepare something that's up along my z-axis. Bob says, can't do that, sorry. Uh, but if she says, please prepare uh, the completely mixed state, uh, and it turns out that, I'm not sure how much you've seen of mixed states, but one way to think of the completely mixed state is that it's a mixture of uh, a spin pointing in all possible directions, a okay, probabilistic mixture of those guys. Well, if Bob prepares a probabilistic mixture of a spin pointing in all possible directions relative to his local frame, it'll also be a mixture pointing in all possible directions relative to Alice's frame. And so he says, no problem. I, I can prepare that for you. So that's an example of a state that's symmetric, and he can do it. He can prepare it for free. But anything that breaks the symmetry, 
Bob cannot prepare. And so if Alice sends him something, a token of her frame, she's like, OK, look, here's, here's 10 spins. They're pointing up along my z-axis. Use them wisely. You know, uh, he, he, he now has something that uh, he is a sample of Alice's frame. Uh, they'll eventually get used up. right? If Alice says, OK, now I'm sending you another spin, this time you know, rotate it by 15 degrees about the z-axis, please. He says, OK, fine. I'll use your, the 10 spins you sent me before. I'll couple it together with the spin you just sent me now. I can approximate that rotation. But in so doing, uh, his, his uh, sample starts to degrade over time. And eventually, it gets used up. So it's a bit like the way entanglement gets used up if you try to simulate a quantum channel. These resources tend to get consumed. Um, and so, so in this context, you, you can ask all the same sorts of questions. You can say, what two states are equivalent relative to symmetric operations? You know, here's, here's some complicated state. Can you transform it to this other complicated state using only symmetric operations? What are good measures of asymmetry? You know, is, is one state more asymmetric than another? Um, if you can't, you know, can you convert psi to phi deterministically? Can you do it with some probability? Can you do it in this asymptotic sense? So you've got all the same sorts of questions. Uh, and when you try to solve them, um, you end up learning that your, what you thought was true of, of asymmetry uh, was wrong, and you have to refine your notions of what's going on. And at the end, you, you end up learning you know, more applications, uh, having a better understanding of symmetry breaking in, in quantum physics. Um, so questions about that? Yeah. Yes. Oh, they can still define it. Um, the same, for example, coordinate or something by using, for example, the helicity of the particle or something. For the direction I sent you, that's the z. Sure. Um, indeed, that if 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 you know you and I have like a line of sight, then we could at least agree on that direction, mm -hmm. right? If you could see me, yes. then then we might have a disagreement about you know. Merely uh, SO2, you know, the group of rotations about one axis, uh, and we could define the resource theory where all your operations have to be invariant under SO2 rather than SO3. And then uh, what comes for free would be that axis that you share, and what would be expensive would be everything else. Uh, so depending on your circumstances, the group that's of interest here might change. Um, in the context of quantum optics, the group of interest is U1. So uh, two people could have lasers in their labs which are phase locked to one another in, within their labs, but not phase locked across their labs. So, so I, if I tell you, you know, um, send me a pulse that uh, is you know, peaked at a certain time relative to my local clock, and we don't share an origin of our clocks, then you can't do it. But that's another example of you know, lacking a reference frame for time in this case. And you can ask about uh, states that break that symmetry, and that we can use. You know, I could send you a state that's a sample of my origin of time, and and then you can use that to try to synchronize our clocks. Um, and you can do it for finite groups as well. Uh, so there's lots of examples. Yes. So what are the applications of this uh, the resource theory of the symmetry? Well, the, there's, there's a branch of physics called metrology, where people are interested in building high-precision clocks, high-precision gyroscopes. Uh, the global positioning system is an example where you're trying to figure out where things are. Um, part of that is, is doing things like synchronizing distant clocks, aligning distant reference frames. And so the, the story I've been telling about Alice and Bob, uh, you could think of you know, one problem they might face is they start out not having aligned reference frames. And Alice wants to send some systems to Bob in order to make their frames aligned. So um, you know, in a classical world, you could imagine you know, Alice sends Bob an arrow, says, this is my z-axis. And then Bob does an absolutely precise, perfect measurement of it and has no uncertainty about what the z-axis is. But in a quantum world, if she sends him 100 spin halves, uh, he can never figure out precisely what state they were prepared in. He can just get statistical evidence. And so he does some measurements, gets some information. So a good question to ask is, you know, for a given finite size quantum system, what's the optimal protocol? You know, what's the most information that Bob could get about Alice's reference frame? So you want to optimize the quantum state of those 100 spins, for example. 
you want to optimize the measurement that Bob does on them. Because once he measures them, he's introduced some, some noise that he can't get rid of. Uh, and it turns out that the optimal states tend to be highly entangled states. And people have solved these problems and figured out exactly what the best protocol is. And uh, one of the nice things about it is that it, it scales with number of particles used better than the classical schemes. So um, uh, typically, you know, there's something called the, you know, the shot noise limit in, in a standard scheme for synchronizing clocks or aligning reference frames. And, and then there's something called the Heisenberg limit, which is sort of the limit imposed by quantum mechanics. And the difference is that they, they have different scalings with the number of systems we've used. So if I you know, double the power in my laser under one scheme, it's only going to double the effectiveness on the other scheme. It'll square it. Um, and and so, so there's a lot of interest in actually replacing our best schemes for aligning gyroscopes and synchronizing clocks with quantum schemes. The, the trick is that right now it's very hard to prepare very intense sources that are still quantum coherent. So it's sort of, uh, you know, the classical schemes can use very intense sources, and so they have a poor scaling, but they can get to very large n. The quantum schemes have a better scaling, but it's hard to get to large n. So people have been predicting for a while that soon the best schemes for aligning reference frames and synchronizing clocks will become quantum schemes. And, and so these sorts of problems uh, have applications there in, in metrology. Yes? So, I mean, it seems to cry out for an application in space or uh, something, reference frame, things like that are really not, uh, there is no such. Uh, Do you mean like uh, the reference frames? Yeah, I mean like people communicating between two spaceships, right? Uh, Here, Cal's and Bob example, right? Yep, yep. I mean, you know, so the, the technology may be one day. Uh, these kind of things would be more mm -hmm. Yeah, I think even, even on Earth, they've got this problem of you know, making sure your gyroscopes are as precise as possible. Uh, G, you know, the, the space I think GPS is a, an interesting place. There was a paper by Seth Lloyd and some co authors mm -hmm. saying that you could use quantum effects to possibly improve, have an improved GPS system. But again, you'd have a better scaling, uh, and then if you could, you could get intense sources. That still had these quantum effects, you could have an improved global positioning system. Um, yes? How does this how do these works help us to understand quantum foundations better? Do you know? Uh, yes. the mm -hmm. philosophical yeah, I don't yeah. know. Uh, they're just using quantum mechanics, that's helping us understand it better. Well, um, so here for example, again, uh, something that came out of this work was a generalization of another's theorem. So this is work uh, I have a student who's been working on this, his name is Iman. And, and so if you think about another's theorem, it says, suppose you have some symmetric dynamics, uh, then what can you infer from that? In particular, um, you know, what can you say about a transition like psi to phi? Well, another's theorem tells you that there's certain quantities, like, for example, if this is a rotational symmetry, then the angular momentum will be conserved. So the expectation values of all powers of the angular momentum operator should be the same for psi and phi. Okay, and that has a, a lot of practical applications. You know, if, if, you, uh, if you see a particular state and you say, well, what might have come before, you know, that's a constraint. Or if you want to know how something's going to evolve, it's nice to know constraints on that. Well, um, so what, what we were able to show is that there are more consequences from the symmetry than those implied by Noether's theorem. So if you have uh, an open system dynamics, right? So your system is not evolving unitarily. It's being coupled to something else then you suddenly, angular momentum is no longer conserved. But nonetheless, you can define measures of asymmetry, just like there are measures of entanglement. So these are functions that cannot increase under symmetric operations. That's their definition. And you can come up with many such measures. And for every such measure, you get a constraint. You say, if this has evolved by symmetric dynamics, then you know that every measure of asymmetry on the final state has to be less than that measure of asymmetry on the initial state. And so you get. Um, a handle, you know, no matter how complicated this dynamics is, you may not be able to solve it. But if you know it has a particular symmetry, you can get a whole bunch of constraints on what the final state might possibly be given the initial state using these, these uh, measures of asymmetry. And what was very exciting about this was that also if the uh, dynamics is closed system dynamics, right? so that's the case that Noether considers, if you ask 
are, are the other conserved quantities the only consequences of the symmetry, or might there be more consequences? Might there be more constants of the motion that aren't included in another's theorem? And the answer is no, if the transition is from pure states to pure states. But if you have a transition from mixed quantum states to mixed quantum states by symmetric dynamics, then it turns out that there are some extra constraints that aren't captured by another's theorem. So that's a nice example of, of something that I think is very foundational. You know, another theorem, I would say, is a very foundational result. Uh, and, and you can get, you can make inferences about those sorts of results by considering these very practical sorts of questions. Um, the, the other kinds of examples, so this is sort of where I'm, I'm going to be moving soon, is um, the case where the restricted set of operations are thermal operations. Um, so what do I mean by thermal operations? So these, I basically mean operations that sort of uh, are in thermal equilibrium. And then the resource are going to be states that are outside thermal equilibrium. So you might call these uh, uh, thermal non-equilibrium states. And you might call the whole theory the theory of athermicity. I'm trying to coin that term, so please use it. <laughs> uh, so, so it's the same story, right? You, you say, well, you know, what if uh, all you have available is a thermal bath at temperature T, fixed temperature, and you're able to do energy conserving unitaries? And that's it. Okay. So under those restrictions, you can't do any work. Uh, you know, to do so, you should remember from thermodynamics: to do work, you need two baths at different temperatures. If you got a single bath at one temperature. You can't do any useful work. Um, and if you can only do energy conserving unitaries, then you certainly can't just raise the energy of a system. You know, so I can't do the unitary that would correspond to just sort of moving something up in a gravitational field. That's not allowed. So, so the idea of this resource theory is that you're going to somehow capture uh, what sorts of things are useful for doing work. You define it in a way that what you've got for free is useless for doing work. But if somebody gives you a state that actually has some uh, energy in it, well, then you might be able to transfer that energy to another system, use up the energy in this state to do work on the other system. Uh, and so you want to know what are all the kinds of states from which you can extract work. And what's really interesting is that it's been apparent for a long time that thermodynamics is really about the interplay between energy and information. So, so you can use information to do work. This is what uh, Sillard realized. So this is something you know, very early in the 20th century, uh, Sillard. That I, he was thinking about Maxwell's demon, and he realized the following, that if you've got a cylinder containing a gas, and it's connected to some bath at temperature T, okay, so you've only got a single bath. Normally, in thermodynamics, you can say, well, you can't extract any work out of a single bath. You can't build a heat engine. But what Sillard pointed out is that if you have information, uh, you, can, you can do some work. You know, information together with the bath allows you to do some work. So his example was, suppose this gas has only a single atom in it. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's in there somewhere. And, and you happen to know whether it's on the left or the right of the center point. That's your information. Okay, so you have one bit of information. Then you can use that information to extract work. So what you do is you put a, a piston in here that can slide along. Uh, and then you bring the bath into contact with the cylinder. And that causes the gas to expand. And very slowly, it will eventually push this uh, barrier all the way to the right. If you knew that it was on the left initially, then you know that it's going to be pushed to the right. If you knew that it was on the right initially, then you know that it's going to be pushed to the left. And so using your knowledge, you can attach this thing to, say, a pulley and a weight. So let's say you know it's on this side. You attach it up this way. And as it expands, it lifts the weight. So you've used your knowledge of where the particle was to do some work on that weight. And so it means that you know, among the, the thermal non-equilibrium states from which you can extract some useful work, there's not just the states that are energetic, but the states that have some information content. They're not completely noisy. And so this theory is really about trying to sort out the interplay between information and energy in, in thermodynamics. And uh, I mean, so there's not a lot known about this theory yet, but my sense is that just as happened for entanglement theory and asymmetry theory, once you work out all the standard questions, uh, it will shed a lot of light on uh, what's going on in, in the foundations of thermodynamics in step next. Um, should I stop? <laughs>
or what's? I, you have uh, twelve more minutes. Oh, I do. Okay. Whatever you want. Great, great. Oh, that's right. We're going to two thirty, aren't we? I thought we started at one. We started at one thirty. Good. Good. Um. So and maybe I'll say something just kind of crazy and speculative at this point. That um, the fact that tools of information theory work so well at understanding these different kinds of resources suggests to me that perhaps ultimately um, all resources boil down to information. Um, so, so you know, one of the lessons, you know, entanglement. Well. Entanglement's like a kind of correlation. So maybe it's not so surprising that's ultimately about information. But what uh, we realize thinking about asymmetry is that it's very hard to quantify uh, asymmetry if you think of asymmetry as something physical. Right? So suppose I've got um, you know, a rock that's kind of ellipsoidal and then another one that's you know, even narrower like that. So you might say at first, oh, this one's more asymmetric than this one. But it's, it's hard to really do justice to that notion because if I look at the center of, uh, or if, you know, if I look at you know the, the atom on the apex here and the atom on the apex there, they can pick out a direction just as well in one scenario or another. Or, or if this is not a uniform distribution of matter, uh, then I could look at the center of mass, and again I could say, well, no matter how pointy the object is, you know, the center of mass picks out a direction for one just as well as it picks out a direction for the other. So it's hard to see that there's any sense in which physical states have degrees of asymmetry. But if I talk about somebody's state of knowledge of this object, right? so now let me draw a, a state space. So every point on this sphere now corresponds to a different direction in which such an object might be aligned. Um, and then I describe my knowledge by some probability distribution over that, over that surface. So here's some probability distribution, kind of Gaussian-like centered over here. Uh, then it does make sense to talk about a measure of asymmetry for that distribution. Because suppose I am able to sample arrows from this kind of distribution and send them to you. right? And these, these are meant to be samples. Let's say this is my z-axis here. So I'm supposed to be communicating to you information about my z-axis. So I sample an arrow from this distribution. Some of the time it is aligned with my z-axis. Some of the time it's off. And you start doing readouts on those things. Um, well, if, if it's a very broad distribution, that at the end of the day, you have a lot of uncertainty about where my z-axis is. But if it's a very narrow distribution, then you have much more certainty about where my z-axis is. So, so the narrow distribution is a better resource than the broad distribution for the purposes of my communicating information about the z-axis to you. And so we can start to quantify how much better one thing is than another. And we can think of that as a measure of the asymmetry of this probability distribution. If the distribution were totally flat over the whole sphere, it would be completely symmetric, and it would be absolutely useless for sending information about a direction in space. So, so what sort of emerged here is, is the idea that um, the things that have asymmetry are really states of knowledge, not states of reality. The things for which we can measure asymmetry are probability distributions. Um, in the quantum context, quantum states. Uh, and many people believe that quantum states should be thought of as like classical probability distributions. I'm one of those people. Um, but in any case, the, the, uh, the point here is, is that the resource of asymmetry, you know, when quantified in this way, really becomes an in informational resource. It's you know, how much um, information does this particular sample I'm sending you have about direction in space? Not what's its physical configuration, but rather what's the probability distribution from which it was sampled. And so I think there's an interesting idea that maybe actually most resources are ultimately informational. Uh, Schrodinger actually wrote a book in 1936, I think, uh, called What is Life, where he speculates about um, biology and, and natural selection. And in it, he, he famously says, well, you know, what is it that life consumes? Is it energy? No, it's not energy. If anything, it's negative entropy. That's what life consumes. Because the energy ultimately, the energy budget of any organism, is, unless it's growing, is ultimately conserved. And then it, in a footnote, he says, well, maybe I should have said free energy. And free energy is exactly the, the, the right measure of these thermal non-equilibrium states. Uh, and as I said with the Sillard engine, you, know, you can get free energy 
not by having something that's energetic, but by having something about which you have information. So you know, again, here, free energy. It, it corresponds, in some cases, to just having information. So anyways, the, the crazy idea is that maybe, actually, the reason all these different theories have a very similar structure, which they do, is, is because ultimately they're all about information. Uh, and so sort of the common structure of information theory, which explains the similarities here. So one of my you know, research goals in the long term is to try to come up with a mathematical framework that's sufficiently general for capturing all these different resource theories. You know, right now, we understand this one well and this one well, and they use quite different frameworks. This is a very group theoretic framework. Um, and you, as far as I know, you cannot cast this theory within that framework. But there should be a more general framework that captures them all. OK, um, let me just take the last uh, few minutes, I guess I've got a few more, uh, to say something more broadly about another area of my research. Um, so if, if you end up uh, taking the foundations course, you'll hear about all the various interpretations of quantum theory. And uh, I'm not sure I'm getting the right side of this. There we go. And, and so the, in that diverse spectrum of, of interpretational approaches, there's an approach that says we should think about quantum states as being like states of knowledge, as being like probability distributions about some underlying reality. And most of my research uh, is informed by that point of view, and, and I'm sort of moving in that direction. Um, so, so something I've been working on recently is, is basically trying to reformulate quantum theory as a theory of Bayesian inference. So let me say a couple of words about that. Uh, so if you've ever seen classical probability theory, um, then you know, the, the key things are probability distributions over classical variables. So if R is a classical variable, say it's discrete, it takes on a discrete set of values, then I write down some probability distribution over R. And that, according to a subjective Bayesian, what a probability distribution does is it quantifies your degrees of belief about R. It tells you what you think the relative likelihoods of different values of R are. It's about your knowledge. And then, you know, you, of course, you know, this thing should be positive and it should be normalized. Uh, you can write down a joint distribution over two variables. If this is your knowledge about the two variables, then your knowledge about, say, S is just the marginal of the joint distribution. You sum over all the values of R. Uh, if you want to know what the probability of S given R is, a conditional probability, so you know, what should you believe about S if R takes a particular value for every value of R, then you can calculate that from the joint by just taking the, the joint and you divide by the probability of R. That's called Bayes' rule. And uh, for example, uh, if you, know, you can use Bayes' rule to derive the following formula. If you know something about R, Say you assign a distribution p of r to r, and you want to know what should I believe about s. Given that you assign this conditional distribution for s given r, then you should believe this about s. So for every value of r, here's the probability of s given that value of r, summed over r, that should give you the probability of s. So you get, this is sometimes called belief propagation. You propagate your beliefs about r, beliefs about s. Anyhow, so if quantum theory were a theory of Bayesian inference, then you might expect that, you know, it was about these kinds of things. Uh, so recently, uh, with a collaborator of mine, Matt Liefer, uh, we've tried to make the analogy with quantum theory precise. And so I'll, I'll just draw out what the analogies are. Um, did you see mixed states in, in your course with Adrian? Yes. OK, so, so if I write down row A, uh, and by this I mean a density operator on a Hilbert space A, you, you know what I mean. Good. So, so you also know that not only does this have to be a positive operator, if I take the trace over A, I have to get 1. Right? That will tell me that the probabilities in this guy sum up to 1. So that's the analog of this normalization condition for probabilities. And you probably also saw some joint states over two systems, row A, B. So this is an operator on the tensor product of the Hilbert space of A and the Hilbert space of B. Uh, it could be the projector onto a pure entangled state, but it could also be mixed. Um, and if I want to figure out what, so, so now the subjective Bayesian will say what this represents is an agent's knowledge of A and B. 
And if you want to know uh, what your degrees of belief about system A ought to be, or system B, let's say, you just take the partial trace. So it's just the trace over A on row AB. And this is often called the reduced density operator for B. So that's the analog of marginalization in, in probability theory, where you ignore system R, so you sum over all the possible values you can take, to find out what you know about S alone. So in this approach, partial trace is not a, something you go and you do in the lab. It's something you do in your head. You say, I don't care about A, so I'm going to trace it out. I'm just going to ignore it, and I'm just going to ask, what do I know about B? OK, so now the, the innovation that uh, my collaborator, Matt Liefer, introduced a few years ago was to have an actual analog in quantum theory of a conditional probability. And this is something I would say that's you know, been waiting to be discovered for a long time. It's sort of a natural notion. And uh, it, it has a lot of the same sorts of features that a conditional probability does. So for example, uh, let me squeeze it in here. By sum over s, a conditional probability like this, I get 1 for all values of r. So this just says it's a probability distribution over s for every r. Another way to think about it is if I marginalize over s, I get a function over the values of r, which is just uniform. And so it turns out that the, the analogous equation over here is that if I take a trace over b for ob given a, I get identity on a like the uniform distribution. And then again, I can, I can write an analog of this guy, an analog of Bayes' rule, which is sort of the cr critical thing. And the way it works is you take, um, you can't divide by a density operator, but you can do the following. You can, uh, I that's right. No. You can do the following. You can multiply your joint operator on the left and on the right by the square root of the inverse of row A and identity on B. And you can prove that this thing is, again, positive. Um, it's, it's like dividing by P of R. Uh, but the thing you have left over is still Hermitian. And it turns out this works incredibly well as an analog of conditional probability. And in particular, at any time you want to say, what do I know about system B, given that I have some knowledge about system A, I can use the following formula, which is very much analogous to this formula. And so this is the quantum analog of propagating your beliefs in this formalism. Um, so, so what you get is this, this very nice formal similarity between this unusual way of formulating quantum mechanics and Bayesian probability theory, which suggests that the right way to think about these guys, whether they be mixed or pure, is as states of what you know. Describing the parameters in that describe what you know, and they don't describe the reality directly. And perhaps the you know, fundamental structure of quantum theory, things like you know, why Hilbert space, why the complex field, why do systems combine by tensor product rather than Cartesian product or some other kind of product, uh, all of those questions, perhaps, are the, the structural elements are about what you know. So you know, there's a certain structure here. Like this, this is Bayes' rule. I can apply Bayesian probability theory to anything. I can apply it to particles. I can apply it to fields. I can apply it to horse races. Uh, so in a sense, Bayesian probability theory is a theory of particles. But if I look at the structure in Bayesian probability theory, like Bayes' rule, it has nothing to do with particles. It has to do with what we know and what, how a rational agent should update their beliefs and, and those sorts of things. Similarly, it could very well be that the structure of quantum mechanics, although we apply quantum mechanics to particles and fields and whatever we like, the structure of quantum mechanics says nothing about particles and says nothing about fields or strings. Perhaps a lot of the structure of quantum mechanics says, how should a rational agent update their knowledge in a world that's quantum, in a world that's fundamentally different from a classical world? And that's where the real innovation may lie, uh, in what we know uh, and not how things are. Yes? How do you include priors into your Bayesian stuff? Do you just assume it's uniform, or do you actually have a specific? You can do it in, in much the same way that you would classically. Um, so I should say that you know, people argue in the classical context about how to come to a prior. The objective Bayesians, people like E.T. James, who's a physicist, said uh, there, you know, if you have a certain amount of data, then there's a unique prior you should assign. And his proposal was that you should uh, take the probability that maximizes the entropy relative to whatever constraints you know. So if you know the mean energy, 
find the probability distribution over the states that maximizes the entropy with that mean energy. And you could do the same thing here. You could say, uh, suppose you know the mean energy, so you know that trace of rho for the Hamiltonian is some value. Find the rho that has maximum entropy relative to that constraint. And when you do that, you get that rho has the form like this, where beta is 1 over kT for the particular, for some temperature. And, and so you can, you know, James did this himself. He argued that, you know, we should motivate the uh, thermal state, the Gibbs state, not by some appeal to what's going on in the physics, but just by saying it's the most conservative uh, thing to assign if all you know is the mean energy. Um, and so you can do the same thing here. Other people, like the subjective Bayesian, say, no, you have the priors up to you. You know, there's no algorithm for figuring out exactly what prior you should assign. And you can do the same thing in the quantum case if you like. You can, you can allow the prior to be arbitrary. The, the real content of these theories is how you go from one belief to another, things like the belief propagation algorithm, uh, where the objective Bayesians and the subjective Bayesians are in agreement. Um, let, let me say one other thing about this and, and stop. Um, so, so one of the things that's really nice about classical probability theory is that it doesn't matter how your systems are arranged in space-time. So suppose I have uh, system A here and system B here. And, um, and I know something about A, and I know something about B given A, and I want to update my beliefs about B. I just use, use this kind of formula here. And if the systems were arranged differently, so for example, if events A and B were actually referring to the same system at two different times, so like two different points along the world line of one system, I would do exactly the same thing. I would say, if I know something about A, and I know something about the conditional B given A, then I should update my beliefs about B in exactly the same formula. Um, probability theory is blind to causal structure or spatial temporal structure. So you might say, can we get the same thing in quantum mechanics? Uh, if, if indeed it's, it's prob if it's like probability theory, then it too should be blind to these distinctions. Uh, and yet, in quantum mechanics, we treat these situations extremely differently. Uh, so, for example, in this situation, I say things like, well, rho b is some operator, some map, from the Hilbert space of A to the Hilbert space of B acting on rho A. And that doesn't look very much like the classical formula, which is this. S given R, U, R. Um, but it turns out, uh, and this is sort of what I've been working on recently, you can always rewrite this as trace over A, one of these funny conditional states that I just told you about, times rho A. Uh, I could tell you a long story about what the properties of this object are, and, and I won't do that, but you can write it in this way such that it looks exactly like the classical formula. And what you can find is that in the spatial case, you can also propagate your beliefs in exactly the same way. And the only difference has to do with some of the properties of these objects here and here. Classically, there's the kinds of conditional probabilities you can have in this scenario and this scenario are identical. Quantum mechanically, there's a slight difference between the kinds of things you can have here and here. So we haven't completely eliminated the causal structure. Uh, but the goal of the project is, is to sort of keep going and see if we can uh, extract all the causal stuff out of the formalism and just be left with the things that are about beliefs and about what you know. And then the exercise would be, right, now let's try to describe the physics. We know that the certain features of quantum mechanics are really about what we know and how we should update our beliefs, but let's see what's left over. Let's see you know, if, if we can describe the stuff that we have knowledge about. Um, and classical uh, physics won't be adequate to that. So we can't say that quantum mechanics is a theory of limited knowledge about some classical world. We know because of Bell's theorem and other results that that's not possible. But maybe we can say quantum mechanics is a theory of knowledge of something that's just a little bit weird, uh, and maybe not as weird as many of the interpretations of quantum mechanics on the table today say it is. Uh, so that is a I guess the main sense in which my research is looking into the uh, information theoretic approach to physics, in particular the problem of uh, understanding quantum theory. So, uh, questions? I have a, maybe a boring technical question. Yes. Um, in your definition of the, the density matrix associated with a conditional statement, yeah. the, in the 
negative square root of rho a. Yeah. Um, wouldn't you have that a lot of density matrices are actually fact convertible? Yes, if, if rho a is not full rank, so it has some eigenvalues that are zero, mm -hmm. then strictly speaking, the inverse is not defined. But you can define something called the pseudo inverse, which is just the inverse on that part of the Hilbert space where it has non zero eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. And strictly by rho a to the minus a half, I mean the pseudo inverse. Okay. Uh, and strictly speaking, this thing is only defined on that part of the Hilbert space of a where rho a has non-zero eigenvalues. Mm -hmm. But that's no different from the fact that in classical probability theory, we say right. a conditional probability of it, such as this is only defined for those values of r such that p of r is non-zero. So it's not a new feature. It's, it's just the quantum analog of that familiar fact. Do you have any more questions? Well, let's thanks for... Thank you.